in the Fort Porto as he headed in that direction. And we were commending the police so far for being lenient and convenient with the national unity platform as it traverses the country. Uh, today he's meant to be making route to Kasese district or the Kasese region. But we want to first join him and have an interaction with him. What are the backbone uh, streamlining intentions for the national unity platform in the middle of a season when they will be heading to the elections in a few weeks, if we can call it that, 2026. What's the purpose of the nationwide tour? What are the expectations? And what do they hope to come out of uh, with it? So we do have Juma Kiria, who's talking to the party president this morning. Good morning to you, Juma. Good morning, Priscilla. We are coming to you live from Fort Porto City. It's a cold morning uh, where we are going to talk to... Robert Chagulanyi, the president of the National Unity Platform, has been uh, mobilizing, look, talking to supporters of the party. We want to understand how far and the progress. Uh, to me, with me is Robert Chagulanyi. We want to understand this morning uh, you're on the campaign of the national, the nationwide tour for the party. Yes. First of all, we've been in Mbarara. Yesterday yes. you were in Fort Porto. What is the progress so far? Um, thank you very much. Good morning, viewers. Um, the progress has been positive. Uh, we have moved peacefully. We have not been antagonized yet. So we thank God we've received enormous love and we don't take it for granted. Uh, previously, we've seen uh, security. Yes. Uh, let's begin from there. Uh, they've stopped most of your activities. Yes. Uh, can we say you're now starting to have a, a good, a better working relationship with the security agencies because they've let you speak to people in Mbarara, they left you speak to people in Fort Porto, despite their, uh, their availability in all your activities that are happening. Well, the relationship is actually not between us and security. The relationship is supposed between sec to be between security and the people, security and the law. So maybe the question should be, is security having a new relationship with the law and with the people? And my answer would be maybe. I mean, in the past, the police and the military has been blatantly breaking the law and, and brutalizing the people. Now we see that police has respected the law and respected the rights of the people. We salute them for that. And interestingly, you've seen nothing has gone wrong. <coughs> Nobody has been hurt. No property has been, uh, has been destroyed. So now that sh goes further to show that indeed whenever things go wrong, it is the police. The police will decide whether or not you know, our activities will be peaceful. The police will decide whether or not the law is going to be respected. I want to thank the police for respecting the law this time. And I hope they'll go on uh, respecting the law <coughs> like they've done. But I must say, Kiria, that uh, this is not so because General Seven wants, or oh, this is not so because the regime wants. You remember that uh, they've been put on spot, they've been shamed, having let General Seven's son move across the country, you know, campaigning, even when it's against the law. I mean, he's a serving military officer. So I think it's a sense of shame. Also, um, we can't bank on the sense of shame on a shameless regime. I would say that. Uh, uh, you notice recently we put General Museveni and those around him to the International Criminal Court. And like I said, um, if they brutalize the people, it would be more evidence. So maybe they're behaving themselves because they know that the news of the ICC is hanging around their neck. Uh, previously, most political commentators and uh, people who are against NUP, they've described your party as full of uh, goons, if I may say, are you trying to, uh, during this, um, this this period when we've had uninterrupted uh, processions where people have not complained of anything, any property of theirs being de destroyed? Have you ruined over your supporters? Our supporters and our members have always been decent citizens. They've always been peaceful citizens, and you can see that now. And like I said, um, it has always been the police that brings the violence, and not our supporters, nor all our people. It is evident now we have not had any problems so far. And if, if the police does not brutalize the people, if the police does not tear gas us, if the police does not cause any confusion, I can guarantee you that we shall tour the entire country peacefully and nothing will go wrong. We've seen you open party offices in Mbarara and Fort Porto yesterday. Yeah. What does this mean for NUP in terms of mobilization? You guys have been... Uh, 
accused of being a Buganda or Central Party. And we've seen you being welcomed massively by the people. What does it mean for NUP? Well, we like responding to words with action. Many uh, detractors, many regime propagandists have been branding us a Buganda party as if saying that it's a crime for me to come from the Buganda region. But it's clear that we actually have more support outside of Uganda than in Uganda itself. Look what happened here in Port Porto. Look what happened in Barara. And wait and see what is going to happen in Kasese. So we have support across the country because this is not an, an idea for one region. The people of Uganda in Western Uganda, in Northern Uganda, in Eastern and indeed in the Central are suffering the same. They have same pains and same aspirations and we represent those aspirations and dreams. There are those that have argued that uh, the people that are coming to your rallies are those people that see hope in you and uh, they think they relate with you because of the challenges they are facing in life. Yeah. Uh, that is in terms of service delivery, unemployment. Is this so? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, people who come and support us come to us because we bring them a message of hope, a message of a better Uganda, better service delivery, more respect for human dignity and all that. So yes, people come to us because they see an alternative, they see hope, they see unity, they see a new Uganda. And that's exactly what we hope to deliver to them once we are in power. You're going to Kasese today. Yes. What do you anticipate that the reception will be? I know it's going to be so much love. I know it's going to be so much excitement. I really, really hope the police continues respecting the law and respecting the rights of the people of Uganda. I'm looking forward to seeing you, my brothers and sisters in Kasese, and we'll talk largely about the issues there and the issues around the country. Well, um, during this time, uh, you've seen uh, previously Kasese was uh, an opposition stronghold, yeah. but they've had uh, people com coming in through uh, NRM. Do you think uh, opposition still holds that position of uh, taking charge of Kasese? And what is going to be your message while you get there? I don't want to just bundle us in the opposition because I can guarantee you that there are even many people within the NRM that want change. So for us, we are representations of change. The people of Uganda voted us in 2021. So we don't look at ourselves as opposition because we are supposed to be the government. We just look at ourselves as the option that is awaiting taking power. Our previous, on Monday, when you started your tour, uh, the spokesperson of the Uganda police said that uh, you should work with the regional police commanders and uh, to, to ensure that you have a peaceful process, uh, pro process during this time. But then he said it shouldn't be a campaigning process. We've seen you gather people in playground at the playground in Barara and the garden in Fort Porto. Are you campaigning? This is a wake-up campaign. It is a wake-up campaign. It's a wake-up call. This campaign is called Wake Up Uganda, Uganda Zukuka. So we are awakening up the people, reminding them of their responsibility, reminding them that this is their country, they should not leave matters to me. When I said because Chagulani, some people took it literal. So it's important for me to remind the people of Uganda, beginning from Western Uganda here, that this is not only about Chagulani or those that he leaves you with, it's about you as well, my brother, my sister. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you do, it's about all of us. So if we come together, we can change our destiny, and that is what we are calling upon people to do. So, yes, it's a wake-up campaign. What has been your message among, across all these people that you've spoken to? Because, like we said, they are coming to you because they think there's hope. What is your message that you're giving to them? It has been a reiteration uh, of our usual fundamental message, generally, for the country and particular messages for those areas that we go to. We are reminding them of what we aspire to bring to them in a new Uganda that is servant leadership, that is a return to democracy, that is a revamption of health uh, care and education and all that. But most importantly, we are reminding them that it is within their power to achieve this, not within the power of anybody else, but them, you know, they went to the polls, they elected us, we were not able to go in government because using the gun genome 70 took over we are reminding them that it is not only the election that matters many people have been trying to 
point us to 2026 because that's what General Museveni wants. He wants us to forget about what he has just stolen in 2021 and focus us on 2026. We are saying we are not only focusing on 2026. We are focusing on now. We want change now. We want to awaken our people now so that they don't sleep waiting for 2026 in which other election General Museveni could do the same thing. But if we awaken them now, if they know their responsibility now, I am sure that before, even before 2026, they can do something that can fundamentally alter the fortunes of this country. We've seen a program that was released by NUP. Yes. You're going to tour the entire country. Yes. NUP is a young party born uh, recently. Do you have the funds to fund all these activities? That's a very interesting question. Do we have the funds? We don't need the funds. Unlike <laughs> General Museveni, or his son, who needs five billion to have the activity that we had in Barara, five billion to have one we had in Kasese, we need less than five million. All we need is a fuel. In our, in fact, in my car, in the car that uh, carries uh, uh, my team, my, my security team, and maybe my, our, our other leaders. We need fuel for just three cars. Other cars are going to be funded by their own drivers, our leaders, the MPs, and all that. We only need the fuel, food, and accommodation, period. Everything else just shows up. So we don't need money to do this. No, it is the will to do it. We know what we're doing is right. Sometimes we even park at a uh, petrol station, we want to pay for fuel, but after filling our cars, somebody comes and whispers, hey, the gentleman there said, your fuel is paid, just go. We go to a restaurant, eat food, after eating food, before we pay, somebody says, ah, Bobby, don't worry, somebody has paid for that. So it's not a money thing, it is love that keeps us going. Uh, Bobby, uh, on Monday when you were in Barara, you were, you were supposed to, I should say, you were supposed to be hosted on a digital radio station. Yes. When you got inside there, it was switched off, the power went off. What do you make of this move? And yesterday we, all, we thought it would happen to you at uh, Jubilee radio station, but you were given one opportunity to speak. Yes. What does it mean to this process of you are into? Like I said, we are not moving because the regime wants us to move. Whenever they can sabotage us silently, they do. They do. Now we were able to expose all the injustices that they were doing to us not only nationally, but internationally, and that has had an effect on them. So they only block us in subtle ways. Yes, when I was in Barara, they switched off the radio station because they fear this message. They know this message that we give the people is moral, is awakening, and it debunks all the lies that the regime has been propagating. So they switched off the radio. What we did is expose it. It was all over news, and they were exposed and ashamed. And I believe that is the reason why they didn't switch off this radio. It's on that note that I want to encourage the Ugandans, wherever you are, you have a role to play. Those on social media, those on TikTok, Facebook, uh, uh, Instagram, Twitter, wherever. Help us spread this message. Help us expose this. We have a theme called Larissa. Mulavise, when you do that, we, we are safe. So by exposing what they did uh, in Barara, maybe we had the opportunity to speak freely to the people of Port Porto. Uh, yesterday, your message, uh, in, uh, specifically here in uh, <coughs> Fort Porto, yes. yeah, you know Fort Porto has been described as a tourism center, yes. and you said uh, it is very unfortunate there is no uh, airport here. Yeah. What do you think would be the contribution of an airport to a city like this that you probably think would be attracting more tourists? This is a tourism <coughs> city the only tourism city that we have in Uganda. This is the epitome of Ugandan beauty. 52 crater lakes, you know. Tourists don't come to Fort Porto on Boda Boda. <laughs> no. They're supposed to come here on planes. We're supposed to make it more, you know, accessible. If we had a small airport here, and I'm saying a small airport, because at least a small airport, but indeed Fort Porto deserves an international airport that would benefit us as Ugandans. Not only airports, we need to improve the infrastructure, have a better road access here, have, you know, uh, facilities. Uh, I mean, for so many years, a stadium has been promised here. It has not happened. Imagine if a Kenya versus Uganda 
football uh, match was in Fort Porto here in this beautiful tourism city. Imagine how much money we'd be making. So we want to stop calling Fort Porto uh, a tourism city only in words. We want it to be in action. And that will only happen in a government that respects its promises. That is the Chagulani government. Uh, <coughs> Fort Porto is one of those places that grew a lot of cut. And uh, the, there was a bill that was recently passed by parliament to, put, to try and regulate cut and... Uh, and uh, <coughs> and uh, weed, if I may say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is your take on, uh, on this legislation, and what does it mean in terms of affecting people's incomes, especially those that are growing cut for, uh, for selling? For clarity, cut is myrungi, mira, or kakola, or anders, or whatever you want to call it. But um, I'll tell you that it's not only mira or marijuana that is being you know, ring faced by regime uh, people that are positioned in places of power, you will notice that gold is exclusively for General Museveni's family. If it's not him, it's his wife. If it's not his wife, his brother Sodo. If not his brother Sodo, his brother Sade, his son Mose, and all that. You know, the same thing has been happening on various other people. I mean, the same guy tried to take over our coffee in the name of an a, a, a Pineti. So now, they know that Mairunji is a big business, you know. And that's why they're trying to ring fence it. Their entire intention is to make sure that the business is taken away from the common people to them alone. That is what they did to marijuana. So many ghetto youths are suffering in prisons for being found with one joint of marijuana. But it's government people that are growing and selling marijuana. I want the nation to know that in a new Uganda, yes, we'll have restrictions because these uh, products can be um, also harmful to the population. But I want to ask here on NTV, what is more dangerous, Mairunji or Waraji? I believe Waraji. Mm -hmm. How come Waraji is legal? So put uh, regulations on Mairunji and weed, but let the population benefit from those elements of agriculture. Uh, I know this is a question that has been asked a couple of times. The World Bank has suspended its funding for yes. in, in this country. What do you make of these suspensions? Do you think uh, it's going to affect service delivery in whatever way? I think service delivery has always been uh, affected, not <coughs> by World Bank. As a matter of fact, we don't benefit from the money that we borrow because that money, in most cases, is lost to patronage and corruption. Most of that money is stolen. Remember what happened to the COVID money, you know. Museveni and his government is a gang of thieves that look for any donor fund that comes, share it, and it disappears. And nothing happens to them. Remember what happened to Jim Oez and Mukola when they stole our Gavi funds. You know, a few days in jail and then promotion to other ministerial posts. So, um... The World Bank money was not benefiting us, not because it's not beneficial, but because it's constantly lost to corruption. We've always been calling upon the World Bank to put sanctions on Museveni's government and to stop funding it because all the funds that are given to Uganda as loans, which loans you, your children, me, my children, and, and grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren are going to pay, you know, are used to suppress and oppress us. Um, we welcome the sanctions. However, we believe that those sanctions should have been tagged to, you know, the gross human rights uh, violations that have been happening, not just to one uh, 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 thing. General Seven has been killing people, and we've been calling for those sanctions. That is when sanctions should have come, not now. Uh, before we leave that matter, if you came in power today and those sanctions still stand, how would your government then survive without such uh, uh, loans coming? We have a rich country. We lose most of our money to corruption. According to the URA, we lose 10 trillion shillings to corruption every year. Crack down on corruption. Realign the priorities of the country. We don't need 80 plus ministers. We don't need hundreds of RDCs. In fact, we don't need RDCs. We don't need all that line of presidential advisors. 
you know, we don't need all these convoys taking CGU, RDC, now taking Minister ETC. No, realign our priorities. The resources we have are enough if they are put to the right channels. I know yesterday you spoke about uh, <coughs> the the money that the resources that are coming from the natural resources yeah. in this country that go to particular individuals yeah. uh, If you are in power today, how best would you use these minerals and do you think we have enough deposits in terms of minerals to enrich this country? Of course we have more than enough More than enough if at all they are not owned by one family. Tenum 7 said my oil, I would say our oil, and that oil would benefit the people who put that money in healthcare, would put that money in education, and you know, we have gold, and recently I think you saw some news that the new huge deposit, the biggest in the world of gold, was discovered in Uganda. <coughs> we are rich, and live alone the natural resources alone, the human resource itself. We are the second youngest population in the world, and these young people are, you know, are creative. They are, they are, you know, they, 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 they are, what's that English word? You see this English also. But these young people are resourceful. They can, they, they are helpful to this, our country, if we put them to the right channel. If their talents and energies are directed to beneficial, you know, initiatives in this, our country. Oh man, Uganda would be transformed in a very short time. Uh, Robert, uh, this country is grappling with issues of land grabbing. Yeah. What is what would be the solution if you came into power to curb all these? Remove places? Museveni is the first solution because he's the master of all land grabbers. Look on all land grabbing cases. Investigations end at the door of General Museveni. Look at the Balalu that are roaming all over, stealing people's land. These are Museveni's people. He's the one that gives them guns to go and steal Acholi, uh, Acholi land, to go and steal land in Busoga, to go and steal land in Uganda. So the land grabbings are all targeted to Museveni. He and his family, they have miles of land in Uganda. Where did they buy that land? They have miles of land in the old rich Bunyoro region. Where did Museveni and his family buy that land? Remove the guy and put, make sure we follow the law. I mean, land grabbings would stop. Recently, even his minister, Mayanja, was shot at by land grabbers. It's Museveni's problem. Remove the guy you will have removed land grabbing and all these other evils. Whenever you listen to President Seven speaking, mm. he emphasizes this democracy in this country. He, in some of your areas, when, when you are speaking to people in Barara and Fort Porto yesterday, yeah. you say there's need to have real democracy in yeah. the country. What do you mean when you say we need to have real democracy? Yet President Seven says there's democracy already. Because what is I'm, not being done right? Because I'm saying <laughs> the truth and Museveni is lying. Okay? I mean, you cannot say you have real democracy in the country when you switch off the internet and, and, um, on election day, when you shoot and massacre people who don't support you, when you are abducting your opponents, when you are jailing your opponents, you cannot talk about democracy. So, he's not a democratic <laughs> Uh, leader, he's a dictator, and we have to remove him so that we bring back power to the people. You know, democracy means the power of the majority over the minority. We are the majority. This is shown everywhere we go, in broad daylight. People are grappling with issues of service delivery. Let's start with education. What do you think should be done to try and regulate this education. People have to, so that they can attain better education, but at a lower cost, because currently it seems to be going out of hands in terms of uh, school fee structures are too high, and yet several Ugandans cannot afford this, yeah. these monies. Uh, first and foremost, fund it right, and structure it right. What do I mean fund it right? Look at government, uh, 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 schools, teachers are, not, are very pro poorly remunerated. And then they're even discriminated. How would you tell me that only science teachers are going to be paid well and arts teachers are not paid well? I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense. So pay them right and structure them right. What do I mean structure the education right? We have for so long, you know, maintained the colonial kind of education, you know, 
only focusing on academics. I've promised it to Ugandans that our education system in a new Uganda is going to be anchored on four A's. That's academics, arts, athletics, and agriculture. The academics is what we focus on. Yes, we need more lawyers, more, more engineers, and ETC. But we need to focus on the arts as well. Not everybody is going to be an academic. Some uh, people are talented, especially we Ugandans. So if we groom young artists from, you know, from, from infancy, we can get the best out of them. I mean, look at me, and I'm a product of artistic education. If we groom our athletes right from infancy, you know, they are going to be the same, they are going to be the best that they can be. And of course, if we, if we focus on agriculture uh, and, and stop looking at it as a backward thing, as a punishment, when I was growing up, you know, agriculture was a punishment. And even we were teaching each other, ah, oh, you look like a farmer. We need to change that because that is not the mentality. In the Netherlands, the best agricultural country in the world, farmers are rich people. And also, we need to know that people are talented differently. The only way, I mean, the only times Uganda's flag has flown high is when artists have flown it or athletes have flown it. There's this uh, historical comparison that you, if you want to use the ability to climb a tree to tell the difference between the intelligence of a monkey and a fish, then the fish is going to be treated very unfairly. So we want to restructure our education system so that we bring up all these resourceful Ugandans in a new productive way, not in a colonial way. I know a lot of money has been invested, uh, has gone into infrastructure, specifically mm. roads. Yeah. But if you looked at some roads, for example, around Kampala, where Kampala is known as the biggest ta taxpayer in this, in this country, mm. what do you think is not being done right to ensure that we have smooth roads, in, especially in the city? Corruption. It is corruption, you know. Money is procured, money is uh, sorry, appropriated, you know, to build these roads, but because the companies that are given to build these roads are their own companies, they're not accountable to quality delivery. I mean, and we are ashamed that the uh, Entebbe Express Highway is the most expensive road in the world, more expensive than all, than all these roads in China and France and everywhere, the most expensive road in the world, and we even ashamed. But you know why that happens? Because we have so much corruption that is not punishable. So if we crack down on corruption, there's a, a funny story uh, during the days of uh, General Idi Amin as leader of Uganda, that this guy made a very poor road. General Amin came, inspected the road, they looked at his face, and the contractor of the, uh, of the road ran out of the country because they knew he does not take that nonsense. Unfortunately, for Museveni, he will reward you because these are his people stealing money in the name of construction. In terms of uh, then health, I know recently the in, in medical interns have been 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 confirmed to go and uh, practice, but it's been an issue that has been running for almost a year. How do you think this matter should have been handled? And are there enough uh, deliveries in hospitals? And how best can Ugandans get? better services when they visit these ho public hospitals? Well, we, lo we all know that our hospitals and health centers are sick themselves, and they need, uh, to, to, they need treatment themselves. What is the problem? The problem is underfunding. The solution has been diagnosed and even noted in many, many, many protocols, including the Maputo Protocol. They suggested that uh, the, 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 the health sector should be allocated at least 17 percent of the budget mm. but look for us where do we put our money in security as if we are at war we buy more tear gas than than medicine we buy more bullets than tablets you know we we recruit more soldiers than health workers even the few health workers that are there are very very <laughs> poorly paid the hospitals are underfunded you know the the, the the those in power are building bigger houses than hospitals. I mean, look at the recent house of the speaker. So, me, for me, I think that it's a matter of realigning our priorities. The money is there. We are only using it to procure instruments of death. 
other than instruments of life, you know, put money in our healthcare system, pay our doctors and health workers right, stock the uh, health centers and hospitals, make sure power does not go off. You remember the sad story of seven children dying in Kamwempe here because power went off. How can power go off in a health facility? So let us realign our priorities. And like I said, it all comes back to corruption. There are those that have argued uh, that uh, Uganda, uh, I should say, has lacked focus. Yeah. in terms of uh, what we do best. Yeah. Some say we should concentrate on agriculture. Some argue that we should concentrate into industry. Uh, do you think this is one of the issues that is lagging us behind, where we don't have focus on particular things that we are doing to maybe uh, uh, set off this country into a particular uh, issue that we produce that should be able to bring about development in this country? I would say that it's not lack of focus. I would say it is having the wrong focus because clearly there is a focus, the wrong focus. The regime in Uganda is focusing on staying in power. That is what matters to them. That's why, that's why all the monies go to maintaining themselves in power. Even when they get uh, a supplementary budget, it still goes into patronage, into getting tools of oppression and subjugation of the people, into, you know, uh, patronage and, 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 and bribing uh, opponents. So there is clearly focus, focus on maintaining power, the wrong focus. We just need to change our focus, take it from one person or one family and put that focus to the entire country and things will be different. I want to take you back to uh, the nationwide uh, mobilization tour. I know you're planning to have a tour for the entire country. Oh, yeah. um, if, if, if it goes the way it is, security was not without interfering into activ your activities, will you be able to cover the, enti the entire program that you put out? Of course, of course, we intend to traverse the entire country, talk to our people because it's within the law. Like I said, I am very glad that the police and other security op uh, organs have not interfered with our legal and moral activities. I thank them, the police. You know, I want you to know that we appreciate this time when you've respected the law. And I want you, brothers and sisters, to know that we are not your enemies. We are not fighting against you. As a matter of fact, what we're doing benefits you as well. You deserve better. You deserve better payment. You deserve uh, better remuneration. You deserve a better life. But most importantly, you, 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 know, you deserve a better relationship with the people of Uganda. When I was growing up, we had the saying that Yamba police in Ayuku Yambi. What happened? Why is there a big divide between the police and the people of Uganda. Why is there a big divide between the people of Uganda and their army? So I am here on NTV appealing to you that it is better for the people of Uganda, for you to work for the people of Uganda, because you, the Uganda police, you, the Uganda military, you're going to be there long after this regime. You need to have a good name, you know. It is better when you follow the law. You are mandated to keep law and order, to respect the law, and to guard people and their property. Please do that, and we shall have a good, good, good Uganda. After this campaign, yeah. where do you envis envisage the support of NUP in terms of numbers, in terms of growth, uh, f uh, in terms of supporters? You will see it yourself. You will see it yourself. I, and I know for sure that all the people of Uganda want change, not only for NUP, but for change, for the transformation of this country, you know. This, this same message that I'm giving you is the same message that Dr. Paulo Kawanga Semogere the late gave to you. It is the same message that Dr. Kiza Besije has been giving to you. It's the same message Jeno Mugishamontu has been giving to you. The same message that Olaro Tunu has been giving to you. The same message that even those younger than us will be giving a message of moral transformation, peaceful transition, you know. It's a moral message. It's a message for the people of Uganda. So. I know that the people of Uganda have always supported it, and they will always support it. And I'm glad that at least we have not been antagonized so far. I hope the police maintains it. Uh, 
I want to hear from you finally. Uh, what is your final remarks to places where you're going? I know today you you expected in Kasese, tomorrow you expected to be in Kabale. What is the message going to be like, and what is your message to the people that are waiting for you wherever you're going? Our message, in brief, has been that you are the future, you are the country, you are the change you need, you know, wake up, don't sleep, don't lay back, don't expect change from anybody else. You are the change you've been waiting for. You just came out of an election which was blatantly rigged. Don't give up. Don't stop yearning for change. Don't let your hopes be dampened. Keep the hope alive. Keep going. Assert yourselves. It's not those that you, I mean, you're not going to change, uh, to change your country by laying back and relaxing. You have to get involved. You have to spread this message. Tell everybody to get involved practically. Finally, many people have been asking us uh, or trying to focus us to only an election. The election alone is not enough. And that's the message we bring to you. Voting alone is not enough. I'm not saying you should dismiss elections. No, don't dismiss elections because we want to change this country democratically. But again, for democracy to work, it must be asserted. For your vote to count, you must assert yourself. Don't just vote and leave it to us. Don't say, because, when I said, because, like I said, some people took it literal, and I want them to know that they should be involved as well. Get involved, assert yourself, spread the word, so that at the right time, when everybody knows, Spread the word, make everybody know, so that at the right time we can rise as a nation from the east to the west to the north to the south. We can rise. They cannot kill all of us. We shall remove the dictator and we shall build a nation upon which the sun will never set. Thank you very much for speaking to us. Um, we appreciate it. Uh, it's never good to end a conversation with Robert Chagulani, but I'm afraid we're running out of time. Uh, it's been Juma Kiria from Fort Porto. Let's take you to a break, and uh, Priscilla and Chris will take you forward.